So who better than Ellie to talk about women in arts as a subject matter? You find women aesthetically more pleasing than men. Engagement. <laughs> Look at Salvador Dali. He beat his wife with a cane. As a man, I have to be very careful about what I say publicly. Welcome back to another episode of the Light Movement Podcast. This is the podcast where we as artists discuss how you can be a successful artist without selling your soul to the dark art elitist system. In this podcast, I am joined by guest Ellie Milan, and we are going to be talking all about, well, whatever the title of the video that you clicked on. We actually have a blank page today, folks. We are uh, we're discussing um, just kind of a whole subject of women and art as a subject matter. We don't know exactly what we're going to be talking about yet. It's just going to be a discussion, and uh, it'll be evolving over the course of this podcast. So whatever you clicked on is what we're discussing in this podcast. I'm <laughs> sure of it. Uh, so, you know, hopefully we deliver on that. Uh, Ellie, welcome back to the show. It's been, geez, at least two months since we, no, yeah, about two months since we last filmed a podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, for those of you who don't know, Ellie is the founder of Milan Art, of Art Social. She's been a professional artist for 27 years. She has started uh, a whole movement of artists, uh, a global movement where she aims to help other artists uh, get the education and arts that she wish she had when she was becoming an artist. So uh, she's inspired, well, tens of thousands of artists uh, and specifically taught over 3,000 artists through uh, the mastery program by now. And um, she is a wealth of knowledge uh, for artists in a vast amount of subjects. So today we are going to be talking about, yeah, women. <laughs> So who better than Ellie to talk about women in arts as a subject matter, as a theme, as a symbol, uh, et cetera. So Ellie, why did we what why did we want to talk about this theme? I think because we were thinking of art club themes and we were thinking of um, you know, topics and and things to teach and content. And uh I raised the subject of um painting men and several of you that weren't too much in favor of it. And only me and maybe one other person was in favor of it. And so I, we started discussing why, why is that? How, what's wrong with painting men? And, you know, the consensus was, well, I just, I don't want to, I'd, I'd rather paint women. So then we thought about why is that? Let's investigate that. What are, what are maybe some reasons behind that? Because truly uh, women as a subject um, not as content necessarily um, as a part of a parable or something like that, but women as a singular subject are definitely painted much more than men as a singular subject. Why is it that, like, what was the, if you could just, you know, for the audience, what was the discussion about, like, why, why did we not, or why were some of us hesitant uh, I guess maybe I could answer yeah, that. Yeah, it's like, uh, why were some of us? Who is this some of us? I, I don't know. Well, you know, it's kind of controversial right now in terms of men and their role within society. I think it's a very polarizing subject, uh, which is sad um, because it's a very necessary subject. And I guess from a business perspective, sometimes in a marketing director perspective, I guess for those of you who don't know, I'm the marketing director of Milan Art. So from a marketing perspective, it can be a little bit- You want to stay um, away from the landmines. Yeah. Well, in some ways you want to, and other ways you want to choose the landmines that you're willing to die on. <laughs> and so it's, it's a tough subject um, purely because, you know, there's this whole conversation of toxic masculinity and like it can- get political. And so it's difficult to talk about these subjects without taking a stance that kind of nods towards something that's hyper politicized. Yeah, exactly. I and and that's that's even an interesting topic in itself. Like yeah. what is what are artists roles and I can't speak for other artists and I wouldn't even want to or dare to, but mm -hmm. um my personal policy that I personally have for myself, agree with it or disagree with it, I don't really care. My personal policy is I, I will publicly speak about what I have authority in and what I've lived and what I've personally experienced and, um, and stay in my lane. I might have opinions and feel strongly about things, um, you know, that are typically and traditionally, you know, volatile or, you know, cause argument or, or, you know, heated discourse, but 
I, I'm, I have opinions and I have a right to those opinions, but it's not my platform to talk about them or, you know, share my opinions on those things. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel like as an artist, it's my cause to just because I'm an artist start, you know, painting and, and getting on my soapbox about all my opinions uh, unless it is something that I've lived and I personally experience and I have authority in. What I experience have authority in is, is you know, this narrow, and that's what I talk about. Mm -hmm. I certainly can talk about painting subjects, men, women, or otherwise. Yeah. But in terms of, because I personally experienced that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm speaking from my experience, but I'm, I'm not in my education. And, the, you know, that's my lane. But I wouldn't. I wouldn't dare talk about the political um, repercussions of social. Yeah. You know, that, that's not my expertise. So let's go back to painting then. What is your and what is your expertise? So um, why is it? Do you believe that women are consistently portrayed more in art as a singular subject matter, as you mentioned before, um, rather than you know? versus being a parable, why do you believe that they're portrayed more often than men? Well, I think they've been a source of inspiration to both men, men and women. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, historically, factually, um, there have been more, much more by, I think it's like 90% uh, prominent male um, successful artists that have hit um, public awareness mm -hmm. that... I think is is beginning to turn and become a little more even. It's not even, but it's it's heading in that direction. Um, but for centuries, it's not come even close to that. And I mean, you can literally count on, you know, your fingers and toes how many prominent women have have hit the scene. And you know, there's an endless list for men. Yeah. So it makes sense that men have been um, inspired by the beauty of women and have painted women. Um, and that is our conversation because you yourself, among a few other men, were like, well, I don't want to paint a man. I want to I want to paint women. Mm -hmm. And in terms of um, aesthetic beauty, you find, I'm I'm putting words in your mouth, but I, you find women aesthetically more pleasing than m men. So it makes sense. that That's to me why women have been painted more. Going back to you know, the tide's kind of shifting and there being more women becoming more prominent within the art world. What do you think are like the primary causes of that? The the elitist um, superstructure of the art world is crumbling. Even if it stays and it, it hangs in there, it will only serve the few. Mm -hmm. And because the, the playing field has been leveled and artists can now go directly to collectors and they don't need a system of, of distribution, like galleries, critics, you know, the New York scene, blah, blah, blah. They can just, you know, basically create from their heart, have a, you know, beautiful portfolio, build a personal brand, put it up on social media, be consistent uh, and sell their artwork to collectors who would love it and be their fan. Mm -hmm. So that has changed everything. And so that has invited women to the table um, that whether you're, People want to admit it or not, it is fact. You can go look it up. You can look up, um, you know, uh, modern women, uh, female artists in in museums or public auctions, even Art Basel, which is supposed to be so progressive. If you look it up, it's 67% of females go to a traditional art school. So of the people that go to traditional art school, 67% are female and the rest are male. And Art Basel is like, 80 something percent male. So even though there's more women going to traditional art school, and I would even say online school as well. I mean, well, yeah, our we school, have an online like, school and it's 90, it's 95 a lot more, percent Yeah, it's a women. lot more than 67 percent, right. So there's way more women studying art, but in terms of the opportunity in these traditional, traditional 
more elitist structures, it, even though they operate under the bent of progressivism or, you know, whatever yeah. you want to call it. Yeah, uh, they claim to be progressive. Yeah, right. they, they still support more men within that structure. And it doesn't look at, now there's a few exceptions um, uh, that, that there are some female, um, you know, curators and and critics and, that have made their way somehow into that and are, you know, focusing and really trying to help women um, and get them, you know, introduced. But even still, the numbers are really, really low mm -hmm. um, of living female artists that um, make it in, in that structure. But what we're seeing is sort of two, two art worlds. You have the traditional art world that is very elitist. It's a, it's, it's a good old boy system. And then you have, um, you know, the mainstream sort of capitalistic type system, you know, built on, based on social media and creating a product that people want uh, and the consumer speaks with their dollars, right? So mm -hmm. that's a totally different system. And there isn't any gatekeepers, very few anyway. Um, I mean, Instagram's your gatekeeper, you know? And the algorithm. <laughs> the algorithm, right. Um, and so you you can, you can have, you can, you know, find your way in there. And so that's why I think uh, the tide is turning and more women are, um, you know, they're, they're not, you know, selling their artwork for $200,000. You, you can't do that on Instagram. I don't think, um, that, that uh, nobody that I know of is doing that. The people spending that money aren't on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or, yeah. I mean, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and so, uh, that's not how that's happening. So, um, but maybe that's the way the art world's going. Maybe more, there's more, a whole lot more buyers and it's keeping the prices in this, um, you know, reasonable, mm. sustainable sort of metric instead of these like crazy numbers that, that, I mean, if you think about that, that's a whole nother topic, but if you think about that is any art, I don't care what it is, a, a Van Gogh, a Picasso is any art truly worth Six billion dollars. Whoa, six billion. Well, I don't remember. I mean, we should look it up. But I, I, I think the the highest um, sold piece was. Yeah, now I'm doubting myself. I don't even know. But I, I thought it was. I six thought it billion. was like six hundred million. Yeah, but maybe. E even there was still, a six. In we're there. just there's a one zero difference. So yeah, yeah, it's uh, still a ton of money. And yeah. and you know, I I, I don't there's know that I can even. Difference. I don't even. Think, it's like three zeros, but <laughs> I don't think I can fathom. Um, you know, the difference between six hundred million and six billion. Like yeah. what that means. It's well, all. Well, it's uh, five point seven billion. <laughs> I know, but, <laughs> yeah. but you know what I'm Ten saying? 10 times. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what's interesting. This is actually, I'm going to go on another rabbit trail. I feel like, um, and this is maybe potentially controversial, uh, but as a man, I have to be very careful about what I say publicly, you know, and just thinking about that. Like, I feel like right now, even, even though I'm talking with you, just thinking about the audience watching this on YouTube, the potential ramifications if I say something well, that's true. that isn't. I have way more leeway than you do. <laughs> yeah, that's what, like in terms of the freedom to speak my mind, like I feel I have to be very careful. And so I guess, you know, I-, I and Well, I, how, how, okay, that's a fascinating. So I want to ask you a question. Yeah. So I'm, now this is going to be all about you. Uh, as, <laughs> that was the goal of, the, you know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so as a, as a male- uh, living in the United States, mm -hmm. you know, um, a good looking guy, you've, you've, you've got it all right. You feel guarded and you have to really watch your words. You have to be careful. And, and so I'm assuming there's these fears of, uh, backlash, being misunderstood, being labeled something that you truly are not canceled. Yeah. Canceled some big outcry of, you know, people with pitchforks coming after you. Mm -hmm. And yet you're an artist. Mm -hmm. And so like, when did that happen? When did it happen that we feel so unsafe, even as artists to simply express our mind, even at the risk of being misunderstood? I mean, did did um, Van Gogh or, or Picasso or Duchamp, my goodness, talk about a misunderstood person. Mm -hmm. Like, 
did any of those people sit there and worry about, you know, nude descending the staircase uh, when, you know, or or uh, Picasso and his uh, prostitutes that he painted. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, they all painted prostitutes because they were, you know, inexpensive to hire as models. But, you know, were they worried about being misunderstood or canceled or, um, you know, it's like that. that's something really scary that's happening in terms of art and the art world is this um, fear that I'm sure every artist thinks about of am I free to really voice my my heart, my opinions, my expression? Yeah, and I guess it's it kind of comes back to like, I think part of it is my own fault, obviously. Like it's fear, right? And each person has to deal with the fear um, in order to overcome it and like voice that fear, you know? So I guess I would be afraid of voicing more traditional um, family structure type opinions. It's a, it's a tricky you, conversation. You've painted yourself in a corner. I know. Now it's like, well, what are you, why are you afraid? Oh, what do you have to say? That's so, that will get you canceled. Maybe you deserve to be canceled if you say the wrong thing, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, but I can why, already feel. That's the thing right there. Yeah. Why is there a wrong thing? If you, in your heart, you have, you know, um, um, hate and destruction uh, towards somebody Oh my God, look at, look at Salvador Dali. He beat his wife with a cane mm-hmm. and he wasn't canceled. Yeah. You you think he didn't isn't say- Isn't canceled still. And you still know? isn't yeah. canceled. He's still the darling of the art world. So yeah, like it's all oh, bullcrap. Oh, but he was tortured and misunderstood. He was tortured and misunderstood. So, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, hooligans out there that, that you know, if, if you want to get into canceling, hmm. um, you know, should have been and still should be canceled. Half of, half, half of art history, according to today's standards, ought to be canceled. Hmm. But nobody does that. Mm-hmm. It's just, let's go after, you know, whoever isn't um, agreeing with, you know, the mainstream. But isn't, aren't artists supposed to be... Uh, challenging status quo. Yeah. Uh, What is culture without artists that don't challenge and, and don't have that? uh, It's harder than ever to be an artist that wants to lead culture and not be afraid to, to, to stray outside the norm. I mean, even the things that we teach and we talk about in our school, I think they're very controversial. Um, And, and, you know, we, we wanted to, um, you know, have a workshop and one little phrase, you know, in, in our, in our marketing, all of a sudden sends this, this misconstrued message where, where people think we're this, that, or the other. Mm -hmm. And then it's like just one nasty comment after another. And, you know, you, you, there's just this weird uh, thing happening in, in culture today where people feel like they can join some kind of mob and, all rally and just destroy somebody, mm-hmm. you know, and maybe or it's- that, That's good. Like, And that, that's good. Yeah. That's heroic. Mm-hmm. You've done the right thing. And what it's doing is it's, it's eliminating, you know, our Socratic heritage to yeah. like, nobody has the absolute truth, right? We all have a little smidge of it. And we, we have to be in discussion. We have to be in discourse. We have to share our ideas, you know, and our, our expressions. And that's what art's all about. Uh, so that we can all arrive at the truth together, you know? And it's not that what I have to say is truth and what you have to say isn't. No, but everybody should be allowed to come to the table and share share what's on their heart and from their experience. Yeah, and, you know, just going back to the whole topic of, like, women becoming more prominent within the art world, and, you know, obviously I think that's a good thing you know, just to dispel uh, some, you know, (laughs) potential haters, uh, negative comments that are going to- in case you're wondering, he really does think that. Yeah, because, you know, I spend the majority of my time trying to help these women artists, you know, like like that's like 90% of my time. And then the other 10%, um, time spent working is helping my own wife with her art career. (laughs) Right. You know, so, and then, you know, being a father. Uh, But I guess the- the challenges and what I challenge you, the, uh, you know, if you're one of these people, not saying that you in particular are watching this, but 
The challenge is how do you uplift a certain group of people without canceling another group of people or That's a great, um, pushing another yeah. group of people down? Like in, in that, in this case, it's, you know, women and men. Like how do you uplift women without, you know, saying all men are bad or, or saying that like men deserve to be put down because they've been on top for so long. Well, I personally don't think that. No, I, I yeah, and, I know. I'm, and I am wholeheartedly, personally, with every ounce of my being for women to be successful yeah. in art. And I see the injustice and I see that it isn't, it isn't fair. But the very last thing I want is somebody to come in and rig the system mm -hmm. to uplift or elevate women above men. Yeah. That is not the answer. I don't want that. I don't want a, a handout. I don't want some sort of uh, special treatment, uh, you know, because we haven't had it fair all these years. Or a law put in or place. Or a law God put forbid. in place. <laughs> or for men to be canceled now or, uh, or diminished or accused or that is the last thing I want. I think the the antidote or the best thing, it's already happened. We have this giant avenue. I just like, who cares? Let, let the elitist art world do whatever they want. I don't really care. Mm -hmm. uh, what will have legacy? What will build the future? What will prophesy the world we're going to live in? Shift is, culture. Shift culture is where the consumer is speaking, mm -hmm. where the people who desire the art that, that breathes life and hope and beauty, okay, is and and is elevating co culture and um and speaking life into culture okay that is the art that will change the world this elitist system art is not mm -hmm. that is not what's going to change the world okay so um Th so it's already happened. There's nothing left that we have to do. Just paint, just mm -hmm. be successful. If you're a female artist watching this, just spend a lot of time behind the paintbrush, paint the world you want to live in and sell it. Mm -hmm. You're doing your part. You're doing exactly what you need to do. And in terms of painting men, um, I, I like I just recently painted, um, I want to do a series, uh, a king, I want to call it a king series. And because um, a lot of people are painting queens these days, I want to paint some kings. And uh, so I've done two and I have a bunch of sources and I'm, I am I have others ready to paint. Mm -hmm. And when I painted those two uh, men, I, I really enjoyed it. And I found tremendous inspiration and um, beauty, not in traditional sense, but in beauty and strength and beauty and courage and beauty in- Valor. Yeah, valor, exactly. And something heroic. And not that women can't be those things also, but mm -hmm. it's just like a subject matter that I don't think it's painted enough. And I don't think that men are celebrated enough. Uh, and that, what I just said, is everybody's gonna go, oh, what? That's all we do is celebrate men. But not, not recently and not in the ways I think we could celebrate men. Um, if you look at art anyway, the ways that men have been celebrated are, you know, the 500 paintings of Napoleon, you know, and um, these, you know, men with their ruffled collars and their beards and their, you know, little caps to the side and, right? And their, <laughs> their, their staffs and, you know what I mean? And yeah. they're the other kind of kings. Mm. And, and, and they're not, you know, and most of them were slime balls. Most of them, you know, Womanizer, beheaded, yeah, they yeah. beheaded their wives and they had all these, you know, whatever. They, Rape of the sabbing women. Yeah. yeah. And it's just, it's like, they're not, they're not um, good guys, you know? Mm -hmm. And I don't think enough good guys get painted. Not to say they never get painted. I'm sure they do, but, yeah. but I, I think it's like, I would love to see all these female artists that have come on the scene because men, there's been so many men and they've painted women. And so women have had all this identity out in culture, this visual identity that's that whether you agree with it or not, we see pictures of women everywhere, mm -hmm. billboards full of women, advertisements. It's women, women, women everywhere. Women in swimsuits, women without swimsuits, women in high heels, women. Blah, blah. It's like women, 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 right? All over the place. Think about it. It's like the, the internet is flooded yeah. with with visions of women, so much more so than men, mm -hmm. and and so there's there's these um, little I you know pictures of identity that go out there, and we're raised with it, and then you know you have this whole conversation about you know body image and and all this stuff because these images mm -hmm. of of 
of what women look like. I think that, you know, we have all these female artists now and if they began painting men and they painted valor and they painted nobility and they, tr- they, they painted goodness, strength yeah. and courage and, um, you know, those, those things that, that, you know, men aren't celebrated enough for what would happen? You know, what if, what if we painted fathers? What if we painted, um, commitment? You know, what if we painted like basically yeah. take our complaints about men, right. And, and flip it and paint it, paint the other side of it. Yeah. You know, if, if there's a, a, a problem in culture that fathers don't stick around, you know, yeah, it's, I think it's honestly one of the biggest issues. Yeah, paint faithful fathers. The cool thing is with the painting, you can make it up. Mm-hmm. You can paint something that isn't real yet so that it can become real. It would be neat to see uh, us paint, you know, our desire. What what do we really desire from from men, mm-hmm. right? And, and to paint that, and I, I believe we paint our future, so. Uh, and men do that too, yeah, you know? Like, yeah. To me, I would like to paint a series of fatherhood, you know, and like, because that is something that I didn't really have to the extent that I wish that I did um, growing up. And I think that it does play such an important role. And it's something that I have authority over. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. And I remember when I first met you and we were talking, it was at that um, art or what was it? We were at some... You were helping out at our table. I don't know, mm. but I, I I just met you. Oh, that art conference in Flagstaff. Yeah. You were telling me about how you were learning Chinese and you were debating, did you want to go into business or do you want to, you know, do creative writing? And you weren't really sure. And mm-hmm. and and I said, Well, what what if if you could do anything with your life? Like you just could achieve one thing and what what would be your ultimate goal, your ultimate dream? And you said, to be the best dad the world has ever seen. And, and I was when like- Dimitra fell in love with me. I'm just kidding. No, that's when <laughs> I kidding. fell in love with you. I was like, oh, Dimitra has to marry him. <laughs> but I was impressed. I was like, wow. And you were like, what were you, like 19 Little or pot smoking 17 year old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you know, I still had those uh, dreams and priorities deep down. And it still is. And I guess, you know, thinking about- Hmm. Well, I don't know, maybe this is too personal, but sometimes like lately I've been getting frustrated and it's not with Dimitra or Zion or anyone. It's like with myself when I don't get to have the time that I want to spend with him. With juggling all the things. Yeah, with juggling everything and prioritizing, um, you know, uh, but it's a process. Honestly, that it is a process. And I don't think there's one parent alive that doesn't, feel that Mm -hmm. even moms who, who have the, um, you know, honor of being a stay at home mom and, and that's all they're doing is raising kids. They still, you know, have to make them food and clean up after them, do laundry. And Mm -hmm. there's all these other things and they'll say the same thing. Yeah. Like I wanted to be a stay at home mom, not to do laundry and clean kitchens, but you know, to spend time with my children. So Mm -hmm. it's, I think it's, I felt that, I mean, everybody feels that. Yeah. And no matter how much time you have, it's not enough. Mm -hmm. What I've been trying to lean into though more is like the time that I do spend making it super quality. Um, But I mean, obviously it can still be better. So going back to the subject of painting women and, you know, I'm curious how you believe that has affected culture over time. You know, Mm -hmm. maybe starting with, well, wherever you want to start in history and like kind of how that's progressed over time. And if there are any sort of um, conclusions or um, correlations that you can draw between, you know, the subject matter of women and different periods of history. Um, yeah. That okay. could be a whole entire podcast. It that's can, probably what we should have done, but. I'm well, <laughs> honestly, I can answer that in one fell swoop because. Perfect. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, I don't even know if you know this, but. Uh, years ago when I went through a season where I was just like studying art history a lot and I was really looking for um, indication. I was I was searching and seeking um, who were the outliers, who changed directions, who, who made the course of history changed, who were the world changers. 
and I wanted to study them. And so in that, what I, what I found is this discovery that if you look at the subject, rape of the Sabine women, it's a, you mentioned it earlier. So it's a painting that has been painted over and over and over again. And in terms of subjects, like a subject would be, you know, painting, you know, the story of the birth of Venus. That's a subject, mm-hmm. you know, painting. Um, the Trojan War. Or, yeah, 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 whatever. It's just any event, any story, or a subject could even be a figure like Napoleon. If you look at those subjects, the two most painted subjects in Western culture are rape of the Sabine women and the massacre of the innocents, those two subjects. Almost every artist that became a somebody in their lifetime um, not after they were dead, but became a somebody in their lifetime. They always painted at some point rape of the Sabine women. And it's like everybody was waiting for it. Like when he, even Picasso painted uh, in 1970 something, he painted rape of the Sabine women. So any artist who's become anything paints that painting, paints that subject matter. So that's why we have so many of them. If you study that painting and how women were depicted in that painting throughout history, from the first time it was painted uh, until the last, you can see how women were portrayed. You can see uh, it it beginning to shift culture. So sometimes the, and it's a collective. So you can look at all the rapes of the Sabine women in the late 1600s, early 1700s, and they're enormous. They're, they're, they're like three times the size of the women that were painted in, you know, the early 1600s or late 1500s, right? And women were becoming this like, large hefty thing. And, and then what do you see in the 1700s is all of the monarchies shifted over to female rulers. Hmm. And then after the female rulers came, they lost the monarchies and it became, you know, representational or parliamentary governments all throughout Europe. And, and then you look at the women, um, in rape of the Sabine women, uh, when that shift happened, when, um, you know, it, it shifted, uh, and, and all the revolutions happened and it went into other forms of government, the women slimmed down and they were they were much smaller and they became heroic. Also, you look at men, men, women, the women were nude early on. And as time progressed, the the men became nude and the women became clothed. Then you look in the late 1800s when, when women's suffrage really came on the scene and then 1920 when, when we got the vote and you saw women kind of really... You 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 see uh, it shift in this painting. So if you ever want to follow, uh, you know wh- how art and how women were depicted in art, you can just literally follow the history of that painting, and you can see how governments, how um, the patrons, how the people with money that were funding these things, how they felt about women, and a lot of times as a collective, it prophesied the role of women to come and changes. And so it's really, really interesting. It's really fascinating. And I, I bet, I haven't done it, but I bet if you if you look at other paintings from that time period, um, you're going to see something similar. So you'll see women, you know, uh, go from more clothed, less clothed, uh, heavier, lighter, uh, how they're, like sometimes they're per, per, uh, portrayed really frail, you know, um, and other times in in mannerism, they're very long legged. They have very short waists and extremely long legs. Mm. You know, w- what does that mean symbolically? What's that all about? So anyway, it's really interesting. You can absolutely follow it. Um, and you don't see those shifts and changes, you know, in the men, you know, and how men are portrayed. Well, didn't you just say though that like the men- It's just in that scene though. Yeah. Like they're the Romans, you know, because mm. the story is about how the Romans- uh, stole the Sabines and, you know, started Rome. It's the story of how Rome was created. That's why that piece has been used as propaganda. So uh, anybody who patrons, you know, well, they'll take the rising star of whoever's the famous artist of the day and some bigwig will go pay, uh, pay for them to paint Rape of the Sabine Women. And they're supposed to express either, either, either Rome is heroic or Rome is a villain in mm. that painting. And it just depends on the political climate. And so, so interesting. it's really interesting. Do you know the story of Aeneas Mm-mm. or the Aeneid, not the, not the Aeneas. So Aeneas is like the, or the Aeneid is the um, Romans attempt at a, well, not attempt, a version of like the Iliad Odyssey. 
Oh, okay. Uh, so the, that's why I haven't heard of it. Caesar Augustus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Aeneas is the cousin of uh, the Trojan prince. Um, what was his name? You know who I'm talking about. He fled Troy to go to, um, to basically, he went on an adventure like um, uh, Odysseus in the, in the Odyssey. Is it in the Odyssey or the Iliad? Yeah, it's in the Odyssey. Well, duh. Uh, <laughs> and it's been a while since I read them. But the, it, the Aeneid is like the Roman sort of um, counterpart to that. And almost like a continuation of the story. But the, the story of how it was written was Caesar Augustus uh, conscribed, um, gosh, who was the author? I wrote a whole paper about this in college because I thought it was fascinating. But um, conscribed the author, uh, Virgil, that's who it was, uh, to write this story as, which at the time was supposed to be, you know, like basically Roman propaganda of like what, Rome, like Rome is this heroic, has this heroic birth, uh, you know, fleeing from the Greeks and, uh, you know, from the Trojan War and founding Rome, right? So anyways, I don't know. I just thought it was interesting and it kind of ties into that. Yeah. Because it's like the same sort of, it's like a parallel within the, I mean, it's all within the arts, right? But you can see the same thing happening in terms of someone, a big wig, in this case, Caesar Augustus himself, uh, conscribing an author to shift culture. Yes. Um, to basically Jake, propagandize. Jake, that's our topic. Now we know what our topic is. It came full circle. Yeah. Because- <laughs> The role of art and propaganda. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Because art has the power to change the world and everybody knows it, mm -hmm. even the bad guys and the big wigs. Yeah. So they use it to intentionally shift culture. And so back to cancel culture, you know, media, powers that be, the talking heads behind it all, right? Are they not infiltrating the arts and silencing artists of, of every genre mm -hmm. and n disallowing them from truly speaking their mind, what good, bad, or otherwise, mm -hmm. for a non-propaganda art world? Right. And, and that's why this art world over here where the consumer speaks, truly it's the art collectors and the artists that dare to paint what they want to paint mm -hmm. um, that will shift culture because this, this world over here is filled with propaganda. Mm -hmm. And if you enter it, you absolutely cannot speak certain things. You, you have to follow, you know, in line. And so it's, it's like, you know, in a way, we're all painting Rape of the Sabine Women. It's just, are you going to paint it the way you really want to paint it and and depict Rome for who it really is? Or are you going to, you know, fall in line and do what you're told and paint Rome the way you're told to paint Rome? Yeah, really, it's more of a question. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. Like, it's it's not a question of like men versus women. There is no versus to, first of all. That's right. There, that whole thing is made up. Yeah, exactly. That's a part of the um, parameters yeah. that are set within that yeah. propagandic structure. But like, it's about the freedom to express yourself without boundaries, I think. Um, whether that's, you know, men wanting to be a stay-at-home dad or being, you know, uh, the traditional father figure and like providing for their family or, um, and, or uh, women doing what they want to do too. But like, I guess it's goes back to before of like putting down one way of being in order to lift up another way of be yeah. being. And I, that's what I, I don't like um, about the propaganda that's out there is it always seeks to condemn um, a certain way of Yeah, because of being. it has an agenda. Yeah. It has something in mind and, a, and an end rather than just be you, be free. Yeah. And and there's a place for you at the table. Yeah. And we're talking without extremes. Obviously, if somebody is extreme in any direction to, to the point where they're harmful to another person, like yeah. truly harmful, not made up harmful, but truly harmful, um, you know, that, that doesn't count, but, uh, and, and that's the essence of it is, is there, there is a, a method where certain groups are taking, um, or people are taking, or anybody with influence is taking, uh, an extreme and assigning it to people who aren't extreme and, and saying they're extreme mm -hmm. to justify 
canceling them. Mm -hmm. And that's really what's happening. And what that's done is it's made everybody get this narrow because this is extreme. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's so much better. Like society thrives way more when there is a more- A larger conversation. Exactly. Yeah. When there's more room for- um, Because nobody has the discussion. truth. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. Nobody, no singular person, no single group, no government, no uh, entity or institution has the truth. No viewer watching, not this person talking. Mm -hmm. Nobody has the truth. We we just have a piece of it. We just have our experience, our input, and we need each other to fill in the gaps. That's why the conversation has to be large. That's why it has to be inclusive. That's why it has to be open to everyone mm -hmm. and, and any uh, thought. You don't have to agree with every thought. Yeah. It's better if you don't. You should just agree with the thoughts you agree with. But listen, and and it might tweak your thoughts. It might shift things. You might open your open up to something. It might it might alter how you how you quite view something. Um, and if if we listen to each other, mm -hmm. if everyone is invited to to the conversation, but if that conversation is controlled and it's only allowed to be this narrow, and if you're on either side of it, you're extreme and therefore canceled then we don't even have a conversation. It's literally a conversation for a two-year-old. Mm -hmm. Our vocabulary is so limited, we're, we're not even having a discussion. Yeah. It's just mandating something really dumbed down and not even real anymore. And that is that is going to be very harmful you know, to, to art, to artists, because you're only allowed to express yourself in this very narrow path. You can only paint women this way. You can only paint men that way because it doesn't fall in line with Rome. It's a great discussion. So as Ellie said, this is a, you know, this is an ongoing discussion. We don't have all the answers. I mean, as you can see, we're just, you know, discussing controversial, by far, this is by far the most controversial podcast we've done so far, I think, um, at least. Well, and the sad thing is, is it really shouldn't be. Yeah, it shouldn't be. That's uh, the con That's what's controversial right there, is mm -hmm. it really should not be. Yeah. But it's, I think it's important, you know, um, and it's within our rights as artists to discuss this um, and as human beings, uh, obviously. Yeah. Uh, so whether you agree, disagree, or um, something in between, let us know in the comments, what are your thoughts on this discussion? Uh, we genuinely do want to hear that and would love to, you know, um, possibly do a follow-up discussion too, if, you know, yeah, if and, the comments permit. So. And a follow-up, a follow-up comment to that invitation. What I would say is, you know, if you want your ideas to be heard and you want your ideas to be, you know, um, considered at the table, then the way that you communicate your ideas is really important. Mm -hmm. Um, they have to be communicated in a way that you're saying, hey, maybe this is a part of the truth and not degrade and and Condemning, condemn yeah. and and assume things and assign and call people names and get frothy mouthed about stuff. It's like just simply state your opinion mm -hmm. in a mature, professional human way mm -hmm. and, and be kind, you know, and that's the other thing is because Socratic discussion is, is not taught or allowed anymore. Nobody knows how to do it. Mm. I mean, that's exaggerating. Lots yeah. of people know how to do it, but then the, the ones who don't are heard the most mm. and nobody really is listening to what they have to say, only how they're saying it. That's all that's coming across is, wow, that person's a jerk, that person's uptight, that person's messed up. That, that's all you get out of it. You don't actually hear what they're saying yeah. because it's packaged in such a, you know, offensive way. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we, we invite the comments, but I mean, I don't care if somebody's, you know, rude, That that's on them. It's yeah. just going to make them look bad. It doesn't make us look bad, it makes them look bad. But if you want your ideas to be heard, say it in a way that, you know, people will listen. Yeah. And if you liked this format of discussion, which is, I think, a little bit dif different than our typical podcast format where we have a little bit more of an agenda. <laughs> <laughs> well, a plan uh, anyway. Yeah, a plan. I don't know. I just like to play with that word because it's, you know, uh, relevant to the propagandic discussion. But... Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> then uh, let us know in the comments also. And you know, thank you for watching. If you know of an artist or a human being who could benefit from this conversation, consider sending it to them and maybe you'll trigger them or maybe you'll get a good discussion out of it with them. Um, that's not even in the comments, but IRL. <laughs> so uh, thanks for watching and uh, check out this other video that we have to show you.